Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for that warm welcome. And can I say how delighted I am to be here with you today? Uh, it's fantastic to be back in Croatia, a country that I uh, love, have traveled, have worked in. Um, really enjoy being back here. And I want to begin by just saying a huge congratulations to Nina, to all of the organizers uh, today, for all of the sponsors, for putting on what I think is a really important forum. Um, this first regional conversation around health and communications, it comes at a really um, important time. And so uh, I've seen the program, it's a fantastic agenda over the next two days, and I, I really hope you have a uh, fascinating uh, discussion. I'm just waiting for my slides to pop up. But before they do, I, I just want to start by saying you all in healthcare in Croatia are actually really lucky people. Uh, you might not always think so, but you are. You're really lucky people because you work in a sector that people care passionately about. Actually, they really care about the work that takes place uh, in this sector. And we saw that most recently in the pandemic where people were out on the streets applauding uh, the doctors and the uh, nurses during that period. So that they care about the work that takes place in the sector. Uh, they also uh, are fascinated by this moment in time because this is a really exciting time to be working in healthcare. Uh, we talk to healthcare professionals all the time around the world, and this moment in time is a moment where we're seeing the potential to solve and unlock huge disease areas that have been plaguing society for uh, a generation. Uh, the chance to see a vaccine for malaria, which has killed hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people around the world. The ability to solve and cure um, issues to do with uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, and uh, potentially even, it's discussed um, within the next uh, decade to see a vaccine or a cure for things like uh, cancer and uh, heart disease. So this is an amazing, exciting moment in time. Um, and it's also where technology and healthcare is really coming together to create modern day miracles. Um, I don't know if you saw this story of uh, someone who has had a spinal cord injury, unable to walk, and with an implant inserted in their brain and through the use of AI technology, uh, they were literally able to not only to get up and walk, but to swim, to cycle, and to play sport. It's astonishing what's happening in the sector uh, right now. And, and it's a sector that is attracting a lot of interest and a lot of excitement, even from people who don't work in healthcare. But of course, um, not all of the passion about health is positive. Some of the emotion that we've seen over the last few years is negative. Sometimes uh, health uh, becomes an issue of concern of distrust, of, of worry. Who would have thought sort of four or five years ago that we would actually have people out on the streets in cities across the world protesting about treatments and healthcare? Uh, it, it's remarkable to think that that happened. And it underscores the challenges that we're really going to talk about over the next uh, 24 hours about what really underpins trust in healthcare um, and how can we uh, how can we do more about to, uh, that, that distrust to, to make people feel more confident? So I'm going to kick off the two-day discussions by sharing some of the data, some of the trends, some very recent data in Croatia as well, uh, looking at, at people's attitudes to, uh, to the reputation and the challenges around health, um, looking at questions around brand and, and does it even matter? I know we shouldn't be having that conversation, but I still feel sometimes people need convincing that it matters what, what people uh, think about the organizations in health. And then ultimately, what can we do about it from communicators' perspective? What should we be doing and what should we be saying uh, to address these concerns? So let's start with reputation. Where are we reputationally? When we look at the Croatian public, what do they think about the health sector? I know sometimes because we're close to the sector, we only see the bad news and we only see the criticism. And there is some of that. Uh, but actually the data would suggest uh, that there is more trust in health than many other institutions in Croatian life. 
Um, not universal trust. Um, so under 50% of the Croatian public said they trusted the healthcare system in general. Um, it could be more, uh, but that's more than we see uh, trust in uh, parliament or government or other um, Croatian institutions. And I should say, I've worked in politics uh, for more than a decade. I would have loved at that time to get trust levels like 42%. Um, you know, there was nobody out on the streets applauding uh, the, the politicians. They were applauding the healthcare workers. So there's work to do here, uh, but we start uh, with a mixed picture, with some trust. And where does that trust lie? What, what's the source of that confidence and where are the problems? Well, we've just recently, in the last few weeks, conducted a survey with a thousand members of uh, the public in Croatia. And we asked them, to what extent do they trust different sectors of society and business uh, in Croatia? And, and just looking at the organizations relevant from, from a healthcare perspective today, you can see that the trust lies largely in the carers, in the people who are doing the caring side. So the private healthcare organizations, the public healthcare organizations, uh, the greatest levels of doubt come from those organizations that people are just truthfully a bit less familiar with. Uh, so the work of the pharmaceutical sector, indeed the insurers and the health insurers as well. Now, if I was working, and we do work for pharmaceutical companies, if I was working in a pharmaceutical company, I might feel a bit frustrated by that. I might feel a bit frustrated that we get only 28% high trusters. And having been through the pandemic, having managed to translate that sort of new piece of science into vaccines that could be manufactured at pace and injected into people to solve the, the big challenge of COVID, and yet um, we, in the last few weeks in Croatia, get 28% uh, trust. But it's important to say that that number's not static. It actually has changed over time. And I don't have Croatia data for this, but I can show data from the UK and indeed from, uh, I have seen data from the US which reflects this. If you go wind your mind back to the, B, the end of 2019, uh, actually, if you ask people in the UK whether they're favorable or not favorable to pharmaceutical and biotech uh, companies, um, you've got about 30% favorable, 22% unfavorable. Those numbers are actually very similar to that, the data we just saw in Croatia, by the way. But what happened at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020? Obviously, the pandemic began to unfold, and people started to ask questions about how we solve this. Um, and look what happened to the reputation of the pharmaceutical and biotech sector. It's unprecedented levels of favorability um, as people suddenly saw for the first time, what do those pharmaceutical companies actually do? They suddenly got a glimpse into that sector and the difference that the sector can make. And so we saw high levels of favorability. The number of people who were unfavorable fell to, to very low levels. But what's so interesting and frustrating is what happened after that. As the pandemic started to recede, um, we saw that the levels of favorability to pharmaceutical and biotech companies went back to almost exactly the point that they started pre-pandemic. Now, why is that? What, what, is that? what does that tell us? Well, what that tells us, I think, is that the pandemic focused a spotlight on the sector and gained some positive insight, but also uncovered some things that people feel less trusting about. It raised questions about the financial role of the pharmaceutical sector in the healthcare sector. It raised questions about um, how do we pay for these drugs and these medicines. And, and that conversation, I know, is going on in Croatia and, and in other countries as we now have a surplus of vaccines for COVID because they're not being used, and who, who's going to pay for them? So it raised questions about uh, money. It also raised questions about the efficacy, the effectiveness of the, of the vaccines. And whilst the vaccines have been shown through the trials to have very positive and robust data, the trials process also showed that actually clinical trials aren't representative, as representative as they could be of the whole population. For example, I've seen data in the United States 
that says there's about 40% of the population who have a, a racial or ethnic uh, diverse background. But 80% of those people who take part in clinical trials are white. So how can we have confidence if we don't feel that the organizations and the trial processes are representative? And that raises questions in people's minds. It also poses some big challenges for the public health providers who have faced huge battles with uh, the pandemic, exhausted staff, um, they've provided an amazing support service, and then we've come out of that and gone straight into a cost of living crisis. And people feel uh, overworked, underpaid, morale is low, and the health providers in Croatia have spent a huge amount of resource on treating in her ill health and not enough time being able to be spent talking about how to prevent ill health. And that's great that that's on the agenda properly today for the discussions. How can we do more on the health prevention um, side? But the challenges of the sector aren't just about COVID. What's really interesting, and it's been touched on already, is the extent to which uh, data and uh, technology is changing healthcare. So I stand here today, I have my, um, I have my, my watch on, um, it's, it's measuring my heart, oh, blimey. Uh, uh, it's measuring my heart, I, I've, got my, I've got my app uh, on my phone, I can, uh, can sync that up, um, and that can give me a, a quick digest of how I'm doing health-wise. Um, I don't need to go and see the physician, I've got my physician, I've got my physician in my pocket. Um, so the, the emergence and the, 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 the number of people who are taking part in uh, data-driven, app-related uh, health experiments to give them an update on their health, it's massive now, it's a massive sector. I saw a prediction that health tech is going to be worth $1 trillion within the next few years. It's a huge, expansive um, area. But it raises challenges, again, for the sector. Who owns that data? What are they doing with that data? Uh, who are they selling that data to? And of course, it's great that I can do this, but can everybody do that? Does everyone have access to this service? And what happens when I discover that I have a, I have a need to go and get something fixed? Well, it's fine if the health providers can provide it, but if not, then it's down to who can pay. So there's lots of questions around data and data privacy. I know that's a big debate in the health insurance space, because the health insurers in the room, they have so much that they know about us. Um, how do we use that data in a way that feels appropriate? And then there's also questions of technology. And I think it's fascinating. Do you want to know what the future of, this, of the surgery space looks like? The future of the surgery space looks like this. It's a robot surgeon. It's a precision robot that can uh, very effectively uh, treat lots of different problems, it can fix your heart, it can uh, treat your uh, problems inside your body, assisted, of course, by a, a human surgeon using a remote control uh, panel. So as we introduce technology in a new way into healthcare, imagine going into the hospital, you don't need to meet anybody, you can do facial recognition so that they can identify who you are. You have your smart watch so that you can provide all of your um, essential data automatically. You don't need to meet anybody. You can wait in your queue to be seen by your robotic surgeon. What does that do for trust in health at that point? I think that trust resides in the people. A lot of trust resides in the doctor and in the nurse and in the human interaction. And the more that we introduce technology, the more challenges we will face uh, in terms of reputation, which is something the sector needs uh, to consider. So I think lots of challenges, but I'm sure, I'm sure everybody in the room is um, as concerned as I am in how we address those challenges. But, but the skeptics out there, sometimes I come across a, uh, people in organizations who say, you know, what, what does it matter? What does it matter what our reputation is? I mean, particularly if you're a, an organization that provides a service direct uh, to a healthcare institution, you, you're not really engaging with the public. I mean, what, what does reputation mean? Uh, uh, this is something that we can't ignore, and we can't ignore because the key stakeholders for the healthcare sector in Croatia all care about reputation. 
And I will, I will show you why. Uh, the consumers, the public, they care. The people who work in the sector really care. And the regulators, the stakeholders, the payers, the healthcare professionals, the political decision makers, they're caring more and more about uh, reputation. Of course, we have lots of different organizations represented here today. We have consumer brands, we have healthcare, uh, public sector healthcare organizations. There's lots of different relationships with the consumer. But I would argue that we've often in healthcare underestimated the importance of engaging with the consumer, with the public, to take them with us, to bring them with us on the journey. We have to bring the public with us. We can't just talk to each other in this room. We have to think about how we can communicate beyond them. And it's not new. It's not new. 100 years. Go back 100 years. Bayer, the uh, pharmaceutical company Bayer, um, it was putting its brand on the side of the aspirin truck that drove around in the Netherlands advertising their wares. Pfizer, when it introduced penicillin in, in the US just after the Second World War, put its brand on the, uh, the treatment, on the medicine, on the... On the uh, on the penicillin, why would it use its brand? What did brand mean then? It meant a reassurance about quality and trust. It was telling people you can trust the quality of this product. Brand mattered then, it matters now. It's big money now, isn't it? We have brand, healthcare brands on everything from sporting events, uh, Bupa, sponsoring events in the UK, uh, to sports strips and sports teams uh, in, in Croatia. Lots of money going into advertising and promoting uh, brands to the public. And it's not just private sector companies. You know, one of the things that we have in the UK, one of the things that is most recognizable about around the world when we talk to people are the three letters NHS. It means something to people, that brand. Um, and that's because it's been invested in um, and it's been promoted and it's been supported. It still needs a lot of support, but it's been supported over many years. So. Brand does matter. And the pandemic showed us that too. Didn't the pandemic show us this? Can you remember? I, I know the pandemic has wiped our brains of everything and we can't remember what happened uh, before uh, all of this. But can you remember back in, in the beginning of 2021 when you'd meet with your friends and family? What's the first thing that people would say to each other? I'm sure it was the same in Croatia. The first thing that people would say in the UK is, which vaccine did you have? That's a conversation that we all had, wasn't it? Which vaccine did you have? Um, and suddenly, I, I can't ever remember, I've had a few vaccines in my life, I can never remember ever having a conversation about which ones I'd had until that moment. But suddenly it mattered to people. Which vaccine did you have? And why did it matter? Because people had different attitudes to the different vaccines, and there's great data on this, actually. Um, there's a survey that was in a number of countries, not in Croatia, but a number of countries around the world, that asked people, how safe are these vaccines? And you can see that it varied by country. So in the UK, truthfully in the UK, we thought all vaccines were pretty safe. Uh, we were very positive about vaccines. So yeah, okay, uh, AstraZeneca's vaccine was, was thought to be the most uh, safe, or as we call it in the UK, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, but yeah, we had a connection to that vaccine. Um, so the Austra uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, great. Um, as you may know, some people around the world were not so positive about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, particularly some people in France that won't dwell on that. But in France, definitely, they weren't big fans of the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. In Germany, uh, they were strong preferers, or at least they felt that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was the most safe. I think BioNTech is a German company. So they had a connection to the brand. And Moderna, nobody really knew a lot about. So actually, it tended to score less safe in their perception because people didn't know about the company. So this isn't a new conversation. When you meet skeptics who say, why do we care about what the consumers think? Um, we've always cared. Pharmaceutical companies, healthcare companies have always cared. Our brands have always mattered. And COVID just reinforces the fact that people are interested and engaged by this. And so we need to understand that trust matters, not just because it helps me sell things. It does help. You know, if I'm Nestle and people trust me from a perspective of health, that will help unlock purchasing. 
Um, but it's not just about that. It's about our ability to get people to support our decisions, to recommend what we do. Am I going to feel confident about the COVID vaccine? Am I going to be supportive of this new treatment? And if you're in the public sector in Croatia, if you're running a hospital or you're um, responsible for managing uh, the budgets, how do we ensure that the public are seeing our services as worth defending when there are too many priorities and not enough money? So the public matter, trust matters uh, in this sector to a consumer audience, even if we aren't engaging them in a, in a purchasing decision. But the really interesting bit for me is about talent. It's about talent because we're in a fight. This sector is in a big fight. And I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, I don't think that the sector fully realizes the fight that we're about to get into. Because Certainly if you're outside of the sector and you think about what does a, what does a, a lab look like, people sort of bring to mind, uh, well, this is okay, this is 1925 Rockefeller Institute, so maybe things have changed a little, but it's a lab, it's got flasks, it's got tubes. Um, but actually the healthcare sector is very different now. The healthcare sector is about robotics. This is a picture from the AstraZeneca lab. Um, the healthcare sector is about data and genomics and AI and machine learning. And if that's the thing that will unlock those amazing future healthcare benefits, who do we need to hire? Well, we still need research scientists, but we also need data scientists. We still need manufacturing engineers, but we now need software engineers and programmers. And what that does, which we have to, in this room, really understand and realize, is it brings us into a fight that we've not had before. Not with each other for talent. We're now fighting Google and Amazon Web Services and Meta for talent. Big brands with big budgets. And that's quite a challenge. But what's interesting is that we have, in this sector, things that they don't have. We have the ability um, to bring them into the, uh, the opportunity to change people's lives for the better in a really fundamental way. So I was talking to a tech uh, engineer the other day, and he said, in a, in a conversation around these things, why would I want to work for a tech company when my job is essentially improving that algorithm by 1% so that their ads can be more effective, when I could work in a pharmaceutical sector and I could improve the life chances of 1% of the population. Now, that's a big selling point for the sector, but only if we're articulating that and communicating that uh, effectively. But you don't have to take my word for it. Let's, let's ask the public, what do the Croatian public think about the different sectors? and Where would they want to work? Well, we asked them in a survey only a few weeks ago, um, and this is showing... The, the average score, the mean score, of levels of interest in working in different sectors. And we've broken that data out by age of respondent to give you a sense of the different generations. And I've ranked this by uh, the youngest demographic. So let's start with them. If you're 18 to 29, well, actually, what it was to be 18 to 29, we want to work anywhere, don't we? I mean, they love, they love all the sectors. Yes, I'll work anywhere. Um, but, but actually, three of the top four organizations that they would want to work for, public health organizations, pharmaceutical companies, and private healthcare companies. So health is in their, in their in area of interest. They're interested in the health sector as a potential place to work. Not as popular as digital platforms, though. Okay? Just worth noting. But if we move up a demographic to the 30 to 45-year-olds, it's a slightly different picture. Actually, the top three places I'd like to work if I'm in the 30 uh, to 45 category are digital platforms, tech manufacturers, and oil and gas companies. These are Croatian respondents um, filling in a survey uh, three or four weeks ago. That shows you the fight that we're in. Yeah, we're not arguing with each other about talent anymore. We're arguing with big companies with big budgets, uh, household names, tech expertise. Um, we have tools that we can use in the sector, but we need to wake up. We need to start using those tools. And it's not just about talent. 
It's also about partnerships. You all are here today because you want to collaborate and help solve some of these big questions. And, and the healthcare sector is traditionally, s s some differences, but pretty good at building collaborations. The pandemic showed that, organizations coming together, partnerships, uh, acquisitions, organizations merging. Um, and so reputation matters if you want to build a new relationship with an academic institution, or if you want to partner with a big tech organization, or indeed if you want to move into a new sector, your reputation matters. It's important that you are thinking from a sector perspective, but also from a brand perspective, what people think about your organization, because it, it has an impact on your ability to partner, to acquire, and to grow successfully. And what about that final group? I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about stakeholders. Uh, I think we know in this room that reputation matters to that group of people. Of course, our products matter, our services matter, but actually, increasingly, in this interesting study published in, in March uh, this year, it's a US-focused study, but interesting that of all the criteria, once you took the product aspect away, the healthcare professionals interviewed said that corporate reputation was the most important thing that affected the products that they would uh, prescribe. Translate that into a Croatian or a UK context. The payers, the decision makers are looking not just at what we're making, they're looking at who's making it and what we stand for as an organization. And I think we all know, but that test, that reputation test is getting higher and higher every year. So the list of things that we now need to fulfill and to meet as a sector is much bigger. It's not just about quality and safety. That's sort of expected. It's important, but it's expected. It's about who has access to this medicine, how much will it cost, how can people get this treatment, and not just people in our country, how can we make sure this treatment is available to people around uh, the world? It's about ESG. It's about ESG, it's about the environmental, social, and governance questions. What are we doing for the planet? What impact are we having on society? And who runs this organization? And what's the leadership like? Those are questions that people are being asked. It's about data. What are you doing with your data? What are you doing with my data? Who are you selling it to? How private is it? And it's also about what are you working on? And particularly from a regulator perspective and a, a, a governmental perspective, are you helping us to solve things that we haven't yet solved? Are you helping us to fix unmet uh, needs? So I think there are big challenges for today's, uh, this event's discussion. I think that there are important issues to talk about as to why reputation matters to us and, and to go back to our organizations and make the case again for taking this seriously. Because if we take seriously the challenges, and the importance of our reputation, what that leads us to is communications. We need to be better at telling our story. And on the basis of the things that we've studied and the work that we've done, there are some key examples of good practice that I'll share quickly, and then I'd love to take some questions from, from you. But before I do, I sort of detect, I don't know, I'd be interested in your questions. I detect in lots of organizations in the healthcare space that we work with, a nervousness about communications. Shall I call it a nervousness? Caution, maybe. We're, we're worried about communicating. We're worried about what it means. We're worried about getting it wrong. And so the, the, often the response is to say nothing, actually. I, I'm, I'm just going to keep quiet. I don't want to cause a problem, so I won't say anything. But that's part of the problem, isn't it? Because the foundation, as Nina said at the beginning, the foundation of trust is transparency, it's openness, it's communications, it's taking people with us on the journey. And I'm not just telling you this, I can show you it in data. Um, we took 25 countries that we have da uh, data on, um, uh, they're not Croatian companies, but 25 companies, and we, we measured them on the extent to which I know the company, how familiar am I, and the extent to which I trust the company. So for each of the companies, we can plot those two things into one data point, and it maps like this. Each of those data points shows a combination for a company of the level of familiarity and the level of trust. Now, what that does is it paints for the statisticians in the room a lovely correlation. 
a lovely pos positive correlation. In essence, the more I know, the more likely I am to trust the organization. Now, of course, that isn't true in every case, right? It's not that I want to know anything about you, but in general, the more I understand, the more I will trust. And that is because it's really difficult to give the benefit of the doubt to a stranger. You trust your friends when they make a mistake. You wouldn't trust someone in the street if they did something a bit weird in the same way. So familiarity is our friend, and we need to make the argument for why it's important that we do talk more about what we do and tell that story better. And what does that mean in practice? Well, let me end simply with three areas to focus on. The who, the what, and the how. First of all, the who. There is something about the sector, particularly this is true less of public health, but something about the insurance space, the pharmaceutical uh, company space, that the work takes place sort of behind closed doors. We sort of never really see it. We never really know what's going on. A lot of these organizations have lovely sort of mirrored buildings that you can't, literally can't see in them, which makes it even more mysterious. Um, and people don't have a face to the organization. What's the face of a pharmaceutical company? What's the face of an insurer? We don't, we don't connect them with people. What are the brands that we trust in Croatia? Well, the top employer in survey after survey in Croatia is uh, DM. Uh, it is a brand that people connect to. And why do they connect? We've done focus groups in Croatia. We've heard people talk endlessly about the company. And they, they like its social impact. They like the community aspect. But what they really talk about is the people who work there. Not necessarily each individual, but the fact that they can connect with them. So trust resides in people. And I can put data on this too. In fact, we did a study looking at lots of brands, but we were interested at that time in McDonald's. And we asked, we were studying all the data, what is the biggest driver of trust for McDonald's? How do you improve McDonald's reputation? Something weird came out of the data, which was one of the most significant differences in attitudes to reputation was whether I knew someone who worked at McDonald's. It sounds really weird, but the statistics were amazing. If I knew someone who worked at McDonald's, I was so much more likely to trust McDonald's and more likely to recommend it. Because actually the people who work at McDonald's tend to talk quite positively about McDonald's. And that isn't what most people might think. And so that connection changes how people feel about the company. Simply knowing someone. So it's no surprise that lots of organizations now advertise their people. You know, they bring their people out into the story. The sector needs to do that too. We need to, if I can say this, apologies to the CEOs in the room, if I can say, let's have less of the C-suite, let's have less of the suits, let's have more of the practitioners, let's have more of the staff, let's have more of the partners and more of the patients to tell our story so that we can actually build a human connection in the way that we engage in the work that we do. So if that's the who, what about the what? About the what? I mean, too often the conversations around the sector focus on money, and the sector needs to be better at talking about its purpose beyond profit. I'm a big fan of corporate purpose. I think it's an important thing for big organizations to focus on and, and talk about. It's not a new discussion. If you go right back to the 1950s, the uh, pharmaceutical pioneer George Merck was talking about the importance of having uh, a focus beyond profits. We try never to forget that the medicine is for the people. It's not for the profits. The profits come from the treatments, but they're not the goal. The goal is to find the cures. The sector has a purpose beyond just making money. Are we good enough for articulating that and what that means in practice? It's a, a North Star, that, that thing on the horizon that guides us in difficult moments. It's something that private sector organizations are adopting, but public sector organizations should adopt too. This is about telling our teams where we're heading and what we should be focused on. And it's a guide for us, particularly in the moments of a crisis. Lots of organizations I spoke to uh, when the pandemic hit, the first thing they did was they said, let's go back to our purpose. What does this tell us about how we should act right now? So it's an important guide for companies 
it's also, funnily enough, a really good way of attracting people to work for the organization. Let's go back to that battle for talent with Meta and with Amazon and with Google. Having a, a purpose that can articulate why we exist beyond the algorithms and beyond the profit is a big factor in making people more likely to want to work for the company. Some data that we ran for a, a purpose study in the UK earlier this year, looking at a range of different brands, if I thought that that company had a purpose beyond a profit, I was much more likely to want to work for that company than a company that I thought was only motivated by making, uh, making money. So it has an impact, but of course it has to be done in the right way. And there was a period of time when everyone started creating these purpose statements that put the organization like God, right? We're going to solve the problems of the, of the planet. Very briefly, Aviva had a, a purpose, which was to defy uncertainty. It's, it's, like a, it's quite a big claim. Uh, this was pre-pandemic. I'd have loved to have seen that. That purpose was changed before the pandemic. But you know, how does that stand up? Well, we hit, hit the pandemic. Let's turn to our purpose to define, well, you know, we didn't see this coming, did we? How does that work? So it, it, it can't feel like we're trying to fix the planet. It's got to feel practical. It's got to feel relevant. It's got to guide us in those difficult moments. And there's some great purpose statements out there. And I'm, I'm showing a couple just by way of illustration. Uh, Novartis, our purpose is to reimagine medicine to improve and extend people's lives. Or indeed, and I just chose one from the public sector because lots of organizations, there's a hospitals group in the UK uh, from Birmingham, that has a purpose to improve the health of our patients and communities through delivering the best in clinical care, research, innovation, and education. What both of them do really well, I'll just point out, uh, what both of them do really well is balance what we do and the impact that it has. So it's a great way of telling the story of the organization. The purpose needs to sit in the intersection of what the organization does, the values it has, and the impact that it has in a broader society. Okay, and finally, how about the how? How do we talk about this? Now, you may have seen, I was very politely introduced as Dr. Carter. Uh, let me tell you, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, just to put that out there. Um, and when I'm testing work in the healthcare sector, I am regularly, as they say in English, blinded by the science. A lot of this literally doesn't make any sense to me, uh, some of the science at all. It's like a sort of complex mathematical formula. And too often the sector talks like this because you all are expert people who know how the science works. So you can have that conversation with each other. But take that conversation into the policy world. Take that conversation into the consumer world or indeed attracting talent who doesn't know anything about the sector. Um, you can't have that complex conversation. You have to make it much more of a story the sector needs to become better at uh, not just the science, but the storytelling of the science, of the work we do and, the, and the, the way that it transforms people's lives. And it has to be underpinned by relevant data. Relevant data, because th there's always a wash. Pharmaceutical press releases are wash with data for this and for that, but what does it actually mean? Um, we test regularly lots of messaging, and, and companies will come along and say, we want to spend 200 million euros on a big new project in Europe. And we'll test it for them, and sure, no problem. But I can tell you now, for free, that that means very little if you can't explain, number three means very little if you can't explain number one and number two. Because two million in Europe, great, fantastic, but what does it mean for me? So we have to translate the data into terms that feel relevant. And last but not least, we have to talk in concrete language that feels definitive. Uh, there's something about the pharmaceutical sector and the healthcare sector, we, we don't want to overpromise, so we talk quite often a little bit vague. So we, we aim to help people. Well, that sounds, that sounds cheery. Uh, we strive to help. Uh, we, uh, we seek to encourage health innovation. We aspire to have a positive impact. These are, these are real quotes. Uh, from, the, from the web I, I pulled uh, last night. So real examples. Um, but again, it doesn't take a genius, but we'll show you the data anyway, to know that that doesn't fill everyone with confidence. So in a test, we actually had the same sentence, but we changed the beginning. Um, so the sentence was the same, 
but instead, at the beginning, for each individual response, they saw either we aim, or we are, or we have. And we asked them at the end how much more positive or how much more trusting they felt. Uh, we aim to, okay, yeah, that's, that's quite positive, yeah, quite like the sound of that, not brilliant. Uh, we are, we're doing it already, fantastic, okay, that's a bit better. We have already, we've done it already, even more impactful. If we can stop talking in vague language and start talking in real concrete terms about what we have done, as well as what we're planning to do in the future, not just about big aspirations with big 200 million euros across Europe, but actually what does it mean for me, for my community, um, it will make a big difference to the way that people respond to our communications. All right, I'm going to stop there. Let me just go back to the beginning. This is a really exciting moment for the sector. You are unlocking massive transformation in health opportunities and, and the health experiences of millions of people around the world. The treatments and the, the pipeline that's coming is, is really exciting. You put technology into the mix, there's huge potential. That opportunity will not be fully realized unless we can take people with us. And that means overcoming some of the challenges in the sector. It means addressing reputational weaknesses and recognizing the importance of the rep reputation of the sector. And it fundamentally means being better communicators, taking our comms seriously, being braver about how we communicate, and being better at telling our stories. I hope you have a brilliant couple of days. I'd love to hear your questions, but thank you very much for listening. Evo, vjerujem da je slajdo polučio uspjeh. Ako se ne varam, tamo su na pitanje neka postavljena. Aha, you can read it. Do you want to pick on some? Ok, not. In one sentence. Third. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, for a communicator, that's quite a difficult one. The, the question is, in one sentence, how would you describe the future of health communication? I'd say I'm really optimistic about the future of health communication. Really optimistic. It has huge potential to unlock those big health changes that we're talking about but we have to be better at it, and we have to talk more about how to get better, and that is why we're here today. So I feel positive about it. I feel positive because you're all here, that this event is happening. That's a reason to be optimistic, um, but we have some work to do. You can choose maybe second. How do you build trust in a brand from the inside towards the employees? Is this relevant and more or less important than the consumer trust? Well. I think everybody who works in comms would say, and I think you, you all know this, I'm sure the person who asked the question knows this, that uh, trust has to come from the inside out. Uh, you, you can't tell an amazing story about the company that you work for to the outside world if nobody believes it in the organization. It, it won't work. So trust has to start from the people within. And that story of trust, and that's why purpose is really relevant here, that purpose, that brand purpose story has to be true. It can't just be a dream. It can't be a, a hope. It has to be something that people will recognize as, as, as actually believable, as something that is actionable and true and, and credible in the, in, the, in the company. Because if you don't have that, what, what do you then miss? You miss the brand ambassadors from within the organization that go and tell that story. You know, it's not the CEO who, who wins over people. I mean, that's important. Uh, but it's those everyday experiences that you talk with people every day about different companies. You know, that, it, over coffee today, you're all going to share your stories of how things are and what's it like and what have you been up to. And in that moment, everyone here will be validating what their perception is of each of the organizations that are represented here. We've just done a piece of work looking at talent and how to attract talent. 
And what's, and this is true, and we've seen this in lots of studies, what's the most important thing when you're thinking about going to a new place to work? We, you know, people say, oh, I search LinkedIn or I search Google. Yeah, we, we do that. Uh, but what, what do we also do? We ask someone who works there. That's the first thing that we do. We ask someone who works there. So the, the story has to come from the inside. It has to start with you and your people. Um, but I think we have to, um, we have to do, what do they say in America? Walk and chew gum, right? We have to do more than one thing at the same time. Uh, we have to be able to communicate inside and we have to be able to communicate at outside, outside too. We can't wait to fix the perfect story to take it externally. We have to be able to do these things at the same time. Uh, well, there's, there's a few. So the, the question is, can you highlight one common misconception about healthcare systems that you believe needs to be addressed urgently? Well, I suppose if I was being positive, as I usually am, I think that we talk a lot about the challenges, and I don't think we talk enough about the positivity. You know, the charts I showed you at the beginning, you can read two ways, the levels of trust in the sector. You can read them as there's a lot of people who don't trust, but you can also read them that actually there is a foundation of trust there. And we should, we should not create a self-fulfilling prophecy. By that, I mean that the more we talk down, the more that people will doubt. You know, we need to be honest, we need to be transparent, but I think that also means to focus on the areas where we are strong. And there's a lot of positivity in the people, there's a lot of positivity in the products. Uh, e even, okay, so let's be really honest, even during COVID, there's a lot of discussion about anti-vax, a lot of discussion. I've seen the pictures of protests in, in uh, Zagreb. I've, I, I know this is a, a big debate. And I know, because I've looked at the data, that in Croatia, there were slightly more people who had doubts about the vaccine, the vaccines, than there were um, across the rest of Europe. But the data is really quite marginal. So I think that the average for the EU was 70% said, uh, on the benefit of the doubt, that the vaccine probably has more benefits than risks. In, in uh, sorry, 77% across Europe. In Croatia, that number was 70%. So it's different, but it's not that different. 70% of people still had confidence in the vaccine would be better than, than not taking it at all. So we need to be honest and truthful with each other, but we should not talk down the sector. It has a lot of strengths, and part of this conversation is about unlocking them and communicating them better, I think. Uh, sorry, ah, this first one. Okay, I, I think I should finish on this question because you can answer this question better than I. The question is, why is healthcare so stubbornly closed in a communication sense? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of for coffee, I think, rather than from the stage. Um, so, so the healthcare sector has lots of reasons to want to be cautious about comms. Um, we're working on uh, treatments that have uh, copyright, IP, so we need to you know, recognize that has a value. We don't want to tell everyone about it. We're working in a regulatory space that we need to be making sure that we're doing things in a proper and uh, appropriate space. Uh, we're also dealing with science, and science is a difficult topic of conversation. There's lots of reasons why people will defend the sector as being closed. I just argue the opposite. I would say that actually this is about people at the top of organizations making decisions to be leaders in being more transparent and more open. And the sector, by and large, is changing. These leaders, by and large, are doing that. There's more transparency, there's more sharing of data, there's more openness about what people are working on. Because people at the top of a lot of these health organizations realize if we don't tell that story, we won't be able to attract people to work for us. We won't be able to partner with organizations. They won't want to work with us if we are closed. Um, academic institutions won't partner with your company if they don't think that they'll be able to share the papers um, that they can write at the end of it. So being more transparent is not always in the instinct of the organizations. But I think that comes down to leadership 
And I think that comes down to people at the top being brave and recognizing it's in the sector's interests to be more transparent and to take that message out there. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a great couple of days. Mr. Metcardo, thank you very much.